but let's talk about let's talk about our topic today and yes. for those who are watching <laughs> it's most likely been edited down um so we will have some outtakes of this as well uh especially sure. for our vip members um so today we want to talk about this is actually one that i've been looking forward to a while um for lack of a better term, I called this episode, what were you thinking? In other words, mm -hmm. the most common mistakes um, new entrepreneurs make. <clears throat> and so my biggest mistakes were in high school, which is kind of the beginning of my, I don't know, it's like my, my internship for being an adult back then. Um, and for the, and, and I was, it's funny because we were talking about this in my family, not to get morbid or whatever, it's not morbid, but like my parents got divorced when I was in high school. So that kind of mm. just did a giant splatter right in the middle of my plan. So had a, a, a very, I didn't really have a ton of focus in high school. That's why like I went to a really good high school, but my grades kind of sucked. They weren't great. Mm. They weren't terrible. Mm. Um, and that ACT score bailed me out for sure. Um, but, but there's a lot of mistakes that I had. I didn't have any mentors. Um, mm. There's, you know, I just didn't have anybody around me who was an adult or whatever that would say, hey, this is don't do this. Don't do this. Do this. What do you want to do? I mean, I was literally on my own. It was, you know, right before the internet took off. So there wasn't really the ability to figure things out. Like when I did my college major, it was like, I didn't, I would have loved to pick a school and be able to go in and look at say, hey, what are the top 10 schools or 20 schools or 50 schools for this major? Mm. But I didn't, I was solely dependent on the physical brochures that schools would send me. Mm. And that was kind of where I started my list. So when you're an entrepreneur, it's the same thing. You make a lot of mistakes, mainly just because you don't know any better. And I have a, I have a short list that I just kind of made um, off the cuff. Um, mistakes that kind of jumped out at me. And I'd love to kind of, you know, have you, have you, you know, throw a couple of years in as well. Um, but we talk about some of the biggest, biggest mistakes that new entrepreneurs make, because you will make some of these mistakes. Hopefully you don't make all of them, but you might make some or most of one, some or most of them. Uh, the first one that comes to mind is spending too much unnecessary money on technology. Hmm. So, you know, you, you, you know, you, you Google, you know, starting your own business and there's, you know, all these places where they do, um, what do you want to call it? Platforms for your website. Ah. You go on GoDaddy and they're always, you know, you sign up for a website or, or Wix or, or whatever it is. And they're always upselling you things. Hey, you can get bookkeeping. You can get this. You can get that. You can get all these bells and whistles on your website. But when you're starting out, it's not really necessary. You know, the same thing when it comes to like, if you say, okay, I'm going to shoot videos. You know, you could sit here and say, okay, I want to get, I want my videos to look amazing. And so you get this really expensive camera or you buy this really expensive studio backdrop set or something like that. Um, or you even spend, you know, and we're not even going to, well, actually, that'll be another topic. But, but you spend all this money on stuff, and then you realize later on that you really didn't need to do that. One, because nobody knows you, so there's, <laughs> they're not really comparing you to anybody yet. But two, um, like, you just need to get your message across first. You don't need to worry about this amazing, um, you know, software package or videography package. Because most of, well, I made this mistake, and it's like you find that you sign up for this, you know, this could be a website platform or an email platform or whatever it is. And you, you're going to spend weeks just setting it up when realistically mm -hmm. you just need to get your message out. Mm -hmm. You know, you're sitting here in the background, not sending anything to anybody and working on this. And you feel like you're being productive. You feel like you're being busy. You're working your 10, 11 hours a day <clears throat> and literally nobody knows who you are. And so it really doesn't matter. Right. Um, okay. Well, do, do you want me to talk a little bit about, uh, about that as it applies sure. to myself? Sure. Well, first of all, I'm a bit older than you. Uh, when I, I started basically consulting in the computer services technology arena, uh, space, if you would call it, or arena. I called it an arena back then. They would call it a space now. <laughs> but anyway, um, graduated from high school in 74. Thought I was going to go to, didn't know really what I was going to do. Started 
going to junior college and then I got appointed to go to the Merchant Marine Academy in uh, New York. Uh, I applied to all four academies, you know, being a military brat, but uh, I couldn't get into Annapolis or probably now that I look back is probably for the best. But anyway, I took a chance and went to the Merchant Marine Academy and then realized after six months there that I was going to be obligated to be in the Naval Reserve for the rest of my life. And they only had two courses of study, marine engineering or nautical science. And it was an amazing experience. And just I decided at that point that uh, it wasn't right, wasn't right for me. I was more interested in esoteric things like psychology and stuff. So I left. Um, I could have taken a, I could have, if I had gotten my, if I had uh, got my C card, I probably would have joined the Merchant Marine and could have ended up spending a couple of years in the Merchant Marine, but I didn't do it. Uh, and uh, I guess I was just a little disappointed in the whole thing. So I didn't do it. I could have gone in that direction, but anyway, came back, start, ended up uh, going back to college, junior college again, towards finally going to San Diego State and getting a degree in business with an emphasis in management and organizational behavior. So, but I was always fascinated with computers and started studying them and, and playing around with them right at the very get go. And so by the time I started my business, I'd already, already had quite a bit of hands-on experience in computers, and things were pretty different back between 1980 and 84, as I'm sure you're, you can imagine. Nobody really knew what they were, but businesses were just getting started in the personal computer, microcomputer revolution. So I just was just fascinated by computers and um, just studied it and got a lot of hands-on experience. And in 84, after I... Uh, got my MBA, I decided to start my own business because uh, I was in a corporate situation, making more money than I ever dreamed of, but I was working uh, 10 hours a day. And uh, the corporate uh, shenanigans uh, be it became evident to me when they, when they laid me off so that my boss could take over my job. And I was extremely uh, upset about it, but I decided I'd never do the corporate thing again and decided to take my MBA and start my own computer services company, um, basically doing anything that anybody would be willing to pay me to do. <clears throat> and, um, and then from then on, it was just being an entrepreneur and, 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 and building my company. I, uh, about a year or so, two years into it, I uh, ended up partnering with somebody who had some specialized software and was a good sales type person. Unfortunately, they turned out to be a psychopath um, and uh, I ended up having to start all over again. Um, once I made the decision not to have partners anymore, I started again, literally from scratch, literally from nothing in 87 and never looked back. Uh, so it was, as far as mistakes, oh my God. Um, it's hard to look, I'd say the biggest mistake I made was having a wrong partner uh for those couple of years because that ended up i ended up we ended up making a ton of money but none of that money ever got to me it went to the corporation and and he was uh, draining the corporation but so picking the right partner was a, a very hard one lesson to learn uh and i would say not only picking the right partner but also picking the right associates, picking the right employees, because I did have employees at, at, a, at a point in time. So that was, the, that was the biggest learning lesson for me was to really don't, don't choose somebody just because they seem to have the skills, but choose based on other criteria, um, their ethics, their determination, um, how well you get along with them? Uh, do they complement your strengths? Do, uh, do what are, are their weaknesses? Something that can be uh, uh, dealt with without ruining the company. 
that was a big, big decision, uh, big, uh, big learning lesson for me and is picking the right people. Um, I never, I was always very frugal. Um, and so I, I managed to, to keep things going and to build the business. Um, I always found less expensive ways to do things and, and it was, it was a struggle. Very, very much a struggle for many years until I happened to land a couple of big, big contracts, uh, which I probably should have never landed if they had known what who they were dealing with in terms of my resources and my capability. But I presented myself in such a way that, um, you know, they 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 thought I was bigger than I was, and I landed some very big contracts, and that got me got the business going. Um, along with a little smaller stuff and 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 it's very you know that IT computer services back in the day was very dynamic big companies were going out of business there was the dot-com bubble and all of that and um, I managed to do pretty well uh, all things said and done until I decided after 9-11 that I didn't want to be in the computer services business anymore and basically semi-retired and went off in a different direction. But uh, to summarize, some of the toughest lessons and most important lessons to learn as an entrepreneur is who are you networking with, who are you teaming up with, and who are you partnering with? And that includes your supply chain, uh, other people uh, in, 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 the, in, the business, in, the, in the business that you associate with, your employees, and to some degree, uh, your mentors and or the people that you are learning the business from. So always, always uh, evaluate that very carefully is, is, is my uh, suggestion and advice. Yeah, I heard, uh, I heard somebody say one time, I love cruise ships, I love championships, but the worst, the one ship I don't like is partnership. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you got to make sure of that yeah um all right this is one i know we're probably going to both jump on pretty well i would say number one needing to or number no we're not number one uh i guess number three needing to be perfect mm. and you know kind of everything you put out has to be perfect has to you know your perfectionist attitude if i don't i'm not going to put any content out until i get my studio put up i'm not gonna um do anything until I get all my ducks lined up in a row. And then once I've done all that, then I'll put it out. And it's like, you don't really need to do that. I mean, it's people care about the content you have. People care about your ideas. Um, it's interesting. There's a guy um, who I follow on Twitter and he's, it's funny. He's getting like literally like his channel's getting canceled and he has to keep reposting it up because he's a UFC fighter or a fighter. He's a UFC announcer who after the pandemic hit, didn't have any events to call, right? So and it wasn't like the main one. It wasn't like Joe Rogan and the other guy, but it was kind of one of their B or C level announcers. And right. so he has this thing called non-essential um, commentary. And so he basically does commentary on, well, when the riots were happening on all the Antifa people, or it could be just, you know, you know, a kid doing parkour and just bashing his face in or whatever, but he, he basically does commentary like he's doing UFC, but he does it for internet videos, right? Um, but when he started doing it, he just did it in his house and you could see him in his, you could see him when he shot video on it, <clears throat> that he had kind of a makeshift studio in his house. I mean, he had a pretty good microphone. I will mm -hmm. say that, but, mm -hmm. um, and then he just started shooting it. And then as, as he started getting probably more ad revenue, cause you know, people watching his videos or whatever, then he actually upgraded and actually has a studio. So I'm not sure it's offsite or if he has like a little a granny flat in the back of his house or whatever, but it's like a legit studio now. Mm -hmm. But I don't care about a studio. I care about the commentary he does. I think it's really, really funny. So I don't really care what's in the background, but a lot of people think you just need to be perfect. Yeah. You need to get all your ducks in a row before you can start. Yeah. And, you know, it's like they always say ready, aim, fire, but the perfectionist is ready, aim, aim better, aim better, aim better, aim better, aim better, aim better, one day I'll fire. Mm -hmm. And realistically, the cure to that is ready, fire, aim. You just need to, you know, 
put some stuff out there and make mistakes. And you're going well, the thing is you're going to find people actually like the things that maybe you're disappointed in yourself in. And you're like, Oh, this could totally be better. And people are like, yeah, they love your stuff. And you start to build your tribe. But waiting, I think, is a mistake because you're never going to be perfect. Because perfect is always, really, the definition of perfect is better than I am right now. It's curing the flaw that I see in, in what I'm producing. But when you get better at what you do, just the standard's going to go higher. And you're always like that dog on the dog racing track chasing the bunny. There's always that rabbit on the rail. No mm -hmm. matter how good you are, you could be one of the best video people in the world. There's always things you feel like you could do better or have better technology or, or right. be better speaking or learn, you know, you know, eliminate the mistakes that you see, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it, 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 as applied to me, um, starting in the, uh, like I said, the computer services business and literally being doing anything for money with regard to computers, repairing, uh, programming projects, setting up networks, um, I, I felt, and I think it was just my personality that I wanted to hold myself to a higher standard of excellence than a lot of the people I thought that were doing a very poor job of helping people with their computers. However, I don't think that I was a perfectionist and you, you couldn't be a perfectionist. There's no way you could do it perfectly um, there's no way you can set up a network perfectly. There's no way you can program a software application or solution for a business perfectly. Um, it's just impossible. So to do it perfectly would have been the kiss of death. However, I did feel that there was a standard of excellence where basically the bottom line was, is the customer happy? If the customer is happy, and you can live off of referrals and word of mouth, you're doing a good job. And then it just becomes a matter of getting more customers um, as best you can and continuing to do it because you don't want to be a victim of your own success. I saw too many people in the computer business that were selling computers, fixing computers, uh, or writing software or whatever, and they became victims of their own success because as their business continued to build and they got more and more customers, the quality of what they could do for each customer went down. And I saw, and, and this happened to me so many times. There were, there was, um, I remember one instance that just popped into my head. A bunch of, I, I ended up needing to source a bunch of computers for a uh, for a client, and we're putting together a network back in those days. A local area network was a new thing, the happening thing, and uh, what everybody wanted. And uh, so we needed about twenty five computers. And we went to this, finally sourced this company, and most everybody was like, "Well, who can get the cheapest?" You know, very competitive. And I remember leaving with the computers loaded in the in the van and the salesperson waving and smiling at me and saying, good luck. And I said, why did he wish me good luck? Good luck? Good luck with what? And so we got the computers back to the office and they were crap. Okay. And you can't have crappy computers that don't work right or your life becomes miserable and because you can't give them to the client if they don't work right. So then it became a process of, uh, of, of, of going back to the, to the supplier and figuring out what was wrong with the computers. And uh, it, it, so I guess my point is that um, you, um, you do the best you can, and, but you have to be open to learning all of the time. What, what have I learned from this experience? Um, and you learn more from the mistakes you make than you do from the successes. So um, what was our original? What was the number? What were we? Uh, oh, yeah. number, we're on number three, just needing to be perfect. Oh, right. The needing to be perfect. As you can see, I'm not perfect. I couldn't even remember needing to be perfect. <laughs> so anyway, um, I did have a tendency to, uh, like I said, just get it done 
get it done. But if the customer is happy, the client is happy, which is almost a, 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 you know, impossible for the customer to be 100% happy. But if the customer is reasonably happy to the degree that they will recommend you, that's good enough. That's my advice to you. And stay with that no matter how much your business grows. It's always important to focus on the customer. And I run into that even to today when I'm dealing with uh, some provider or some service. Uh, they always want to know afterwards, how did we do? But they don't listen and you don't feel like your opinion makes any difference. So uh, my advice on the perfectionism thing is just is measure that by how many referrals you get from your clients yep. or customers. Yeah. That's the bottom line. Because your word of mouth is going to be your biggest, is going to be the biggest thing that builds your business is word of mouth. That you can advertise all you want on Facebook or whatever, but word of mouth is the key. Yeah. And, and it reminds me, that kind of leads into the next one was, you know, identifying how you look at your product. And, and um, a guy that um, I used to listen to, he said, there's two types of bait because he's a big fisherman. And I'm not a big fisherman at all. But he said, there's two types of bait that fishermen use. There's fish, there's bait that the fish like and bait that the fishermen like. And he goes, they're very different from each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you just need to make sure that, you know, you're looking at that. And like you said, <clears throat> if you're getting, if you're getting, if you're get, if you have a product um, or whatever you're putting out there and it's bait that the fish like, meaning what your customers like, then you're going to please them. They're probably going to be repeat buyers or they'll ups, you know, they'll, they'll up buy, so to speak, and they'll probably refer business to you. Mm -hmm. But if it's just bait that the fisherman likes, well, the fish aren't going to buy it. So if you're, if you're saying, well, I really like this product, like I'm going to start this business and I'm going to create a program or a product that does X and I'm going to put mm -hmm. it out there. Mm -hmm. Well, you're one person that likes it, but that's not going to sustain your business because you can't sell to yourself, right? But the question is, what are, you, what are the people that are out there want? Mm -hmm. And you need to establish that. And if you're able to figure that out right away and then put out a quality product that's valuable to people, I think that's where your word of mouth comes in. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think you're going to spend less money on advertising and to use kind of the business metric. That's your cost per acquisition. It's yes. going to go dramatically down. Yes. And that affects, mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's really your main driver on profitability well here's here's a here's a tidbit of information for you since you're not a fisherman and i have been a fisherman in the past do you know what lobster fishermen use for bait in their traps for lobsters mm -mm. they use other lobsters interesting so when they catch a lobster they put another they put a lobster they one lobster into the trap because lobsters are social creatures just like humans are and one lobster in the trap will attract other lobsters and they don't even keep them there's no door that locks they create a trap that lobsters like and they put a lobster in there and pretty soon more lobsters are in there and they can leave the lobster can leave anytime they want but they don't they like it in there so that's how lobster fishermen catch lobsters. And I think the same thing applies in, in, in the world of uh, uh, entrepreneur and getting clients. You want to get clients because clients like you. They like you. They like what you have to offer. They feel good about buying it. Um, there are quite a few, uh, uh, I would say, I don't know exactly what to call them, but there's a few businesses or entities out there that pretend like they have a great product and it's a it's a very shiny object and it's dangling and they know how to reach a de an audience of desperate people who are at a point where they feel like they have to make a decision to get something to help them or they'll die and uh, very often these people fall prey to the ten thousand dollar program the fifteen thousand dollar mentorship coaching program of some kind um and then they find out that 
you know, after paying all that money, um, they're basically what they have what they have purchased is <clears throat> a program that teaches them how to be the people that are teaching the program, and it doesn't apply to their to what they really want to do. Um, so you you have to be careful about that um, out there. There's many people that purport to be experts that want to uh, convince you that they have the answer, all the answers to your entrepreneurial situation. And in reality, they only have the answers to their entrepreneurial situation. And it's going to cost you quite a bit of money to find that out. Yeah. And it's interesting because I think oh, if people are like me, you're going to find that like when you start out, you think that okay, here's this person that seems like they have all the answers and they're putting out this great product or program or whatever it is that's gonna, you know, it made them successful, so it'll make me successful. And the one thing that I've found over time is that <laughs> there's not a plug and play system that's gonna all of a sudden, you take your situation, what you're trying to do, you add a system, a plug and play system to it, and all of a sudden you're gonna be successful. So it's not like add water, get Chia Pet, right? But realistically, and it's it's true really with anything, it's about taking your skill set, what you're knowledgeable of and can communicate to other people, and putting in a way that they can they can best adapt it. So it's not like, okay, I need to buy this person's uh, online course builder or how to, you know, how to effectively give guitar lessons or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just gonna take that copy it i'm going to put my name on slap my name on it so to speak repackage it and put it out and all of a sudden i'm going to be successful um but it's really it's not about that and on top of that i'd say like the other thing is people think the idea is important and you just take you know your idea and put it out there and people are going to buy it but um you know one of the things i found is this, there's a there's a saying that says there's not a million dollar idea but there's a million dollar execution Mm -hmm. and, and really what you're doing is you're trying you're trying it's not that you have this product or a product idea or a product framework or anything else like that is going to make you successful it's about getting better at what you're doing mm -hmm. so let's say you wanted to teach people guitar <clears throat> maybe the first time you put it out there and you're trying to teach and i remember i took guitar in high school you're trying to teach people a c chord or a d7 or g7 or a d chord or <laughs> F chord killed me. I could not put that little bar like thing across the chords. I, it would go, <laughs> it wouldn't go, bring. it would go. Right. Um, maybe the way you're presenting it isn't that great. And so you learn to hone it in a way that people can better absorb what you're doing. Um, you know, and as you get better and better and better at communicating your skill set, that's kind of where things get better. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think you know, in the end, it's like, this is an entrepreneurial journey. You're finding out what you're good at, but you, you know, you're going to be really raw. You're going to be a diamond in the rough. You're going to make a ton of mistakes. You know, years later, you're going to look back at your first couple videos and just go, oh my gosh, what was I doing? I was terrible, right? But you learn those mistakes, you get better at it, you figure out what doesn't work. And that comes with feedback, right? So we go back to what the fish like versus the fisherman like. Mm -hmm. and it's not so much what I think, but it's like I'll ask people, you know, <clears throat> what did you like? What did you not like? When somebody buys one of my products, that's one of the first questions is, what did you like? What, what didn't you like? What would you change? And we'll figure out like, you know, is there a trend there that I can act upon? Right. But right. That, that shiny object syndrome is kind of what I wrote down on my end is like, oh, oh, cool. This is really cool. Let me do this. Oh, cool. Let me do that. Or is this brand new thing? And what happens is you get really distracted and you're not really focused on pleasing your customer and solving their problem, but you're more trying to make yourself look good or feel mm -hmm. like you're avant-garde or, or have the cool new thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And realistically, it's completely irrelevant. Right. You know, and I think uh, COVID's taught us that. One last thing, COVID's taught us that is like mm -hmm. you look at people when they do TV shows, right? And they have this really expensive studio, and then all of a sudden, L.A. County gets shut down and they're having to do it from like their kid's bedroom <laughs> with a backdrop. Right. <laughs> and you realize 
Like these people can do their nationally syndicated show from home and some of them are, do it well and some of them don't do it well. But realistically, it's like, is the content they're providing, you know, that's going to be more important than the backdrop. And so it's like, you realize if these people can do, these people have very little expertise of doing it at home. If they can do their nationally televised high budget show from home, you don't have to have the cool new thing. Right, right. Uh, another, <clears throat> another aspect of, uh, of being an entrepreneur in terms of uh, what you have to provide and the audience, uh, you know, the, the customer, potential customer base, is what used to be called the wheel of retailing. Um, and how this works is, let me give you an example. When people, everybody started to realize that they needed uh, personal protection equipment, like masks and gloves and hand sanitizer and all that. And that there was a, going to be a huge demand for it and the supply was not keeping up with demand Many people thought they were going to get rich by finding a way to source this from China or to find a way to be the middleman. Um, and, and, and many people were thinking, oh, this is, this is an opportunity. I'm going to get rich. And I'll give you an example, which is kind of a, a great litmus test, is you go to a swap meet, uh, otherwise known as a flea market or whatever, but I call them swap meet and see what the vendors who are there every week are selling. And I remember that people were talking about, how am I gonna, how can I source hundreds of thousands of these masks or whatever, gloves, masks, hand sanitizer, toilet paper, whatever it is. And what happens is that according to the wheel of retailing, um, everybody jumps into it. And so all of a sudden now, what was in demand and not available is readily available. And then the price drops and keeps dropping and keeps dropping. And so what you thought was an opportunity by the time you get into it is not an opportunity anymore. And you may be stuck with a warehouse full of masks or hand sanitizer, like some people were. And, uh, and I, I use the swap meet as an example because when this first happened, I thought, wow, uh, even I thought, how am I going to? How could I possibly be the middleman on a large purchase of masks and so forth? And I and I noticed there was nobody at the swap meet selling it. But now, everybody's selling it at the swap meet. Everybody's selling masks, customized masks, masks with team team logos on it, uh, hand sanitizer. All this stuff is now available, and the price just keeps dropping and dropping because more and more people have it available, and more people are selling it. So you have to take that into consideration. But if you're, if you're really smart and can be the middleman, there's a controversy in England right now because the middleman who did absolutely nothing but put the, the, the government of England, Britain, together with somebody who could supply them the personal protection equipment, made a $28 million commission on a $150 million sale and every people were saying, well, how, how, why did we put, why did this guy get $28 million just for rec, just put, putting person A in touch with person, entity A in touch with entity B? Because he's smart. That's why he's smart. He made $28 million for literally doing nothing except putting uh, entity A together with entity B. So, Sometimes the best way to make money is not to go and acquire the product and resell it. Sometimes the best way to make money as an entrepreneur is to find, is to find a way to be the middleman and, and negotiate the deal. So that's my second recommendation. The, the third is this. You have to do the marketing strategy and execution that's appropriate to who you are and where you are as a business. In other words, if you're just getting started, you're gonna do a certain kind of marketing strategy versus being a major player in the business who's gonna have a different marketing strategy. In other words, if you're just starting out as a painter, for example, 
you'll be lucky if you can get $5 for your painting at the swap meet, okay? But if you're Picasso, all you have to do is scribble something on a napkin and it's worth $10 million, okay? You've got to look at who you are, where you are in the process, and how the value of what you have is perceived by the potential customer or client. If you're Tony Robbins, you want to charge $10,000 for a 45-minute session of your coaching with some famous person, then fine. But you're not going to be able to do that starting out, oh, I just took a six-month course on how to be a coach, and now I'm going to coach people. No, you're not going to get $10,000 for a 45-minute session. So you've got to be totally realistic and really examine who you are in relation to the marketplace. That's another piece of advice I want to give people. And it relates to what you were saying, Matt, in that some people don't really have a realistic idea or understanding of who they are and what their product is. And so they spend a lot of time talking to the audience, but not in a way they're not presenting them with the right bait because they're not having evaluated who they are in relation to the audience properly. It's like, I'll give you one more example. They took a, uh, they, this guy decided to do an experiment. He was a master famous violinist playing a Stradivarius, okay? And he had just given a concert and the seats were $200. Carnegie Hall, right? The seats were anywhere from, I guess, $50 for the cheap seats up to $200, $300. And he, he, he sold out Carnegie Hall, okay? Same guy went to the subway in New York playing his violin, playing the same music with his case open. He, he, he was there for five, six hours. He made like 50 bucks, okay? What's the difference? Same music, same instrument, same person. You get, you see what I'm getting at is that how you set yourself up with a business in terms of how the audience, the, the potential client, whoever that demographic is, how they view you and what you do does it make a huge difference in terms of whether they purchase it and how much they purchase it for and the value they see that you have to offer. And most entrepreneurs do not get that. So they get trapped somewhere between the wheel of retailing where the product was in demand and undersupplied and now all of a sudden it's oversupplied and they're left with a garage full or a warehouse full of some product that they can't even sell for what they purchased it for. And the other extreme where they think they are such and such to an audience and they're not. And so people aren't willing to pay. Again, people are not willing to pay or purchase from them because they either see a better competitor or a lower price. And this happens all the time on Amazon. People go to Amazon and they look for the best price with the num most number of five-star recommendations and they may choose to purchase from that particular vendor. Whereas there's a lot of vendors with the same product that don't have the, the five stars and can't offer it at the same price or lower, they don't get the sale. These are the, these are the facts. So I think when I, when I hear that, one of the things you were saying is not, you know, one, not understanding what your product really is. And so I think when it comes to like the masks thing, um, you're not selling a mask. You're selling peace of mind. Like if you have a supply of masks or you can make masks back in March or April, you're not selling a mask. You're selling a back, to, you're like selling, like they're freaked out. Like you couldn't back then, it was, it was impossible to find a mask on a retail level. You just couldn't do it. And I was lucky enough to find one place that was like selling them out of China and it took like two, three weeks to get here, mm. but you paid through the nose to get it. Right. And it's funny. Cause my dad's, my dad was asking me, he's like, Hey, you know, 
we want to order some more masks do you know you know who who'd you buy them from so i went back and looked and and they're not selling masks anymore and they said well we're you know we're just curious because we want to see if we can you know if we can save some money i, I said based on what i paid <laughs> whatever you wherever you buy masks right now is going to be cheaper than what i paid um because i was buying them at the at like the point when supplies were the lowest but you're not buying a mask you're buying like almost an insurance policy right <clears throat> to make sure that like you could feel safe mm -hmm. and when nobody else is selling them what you're doing is it's like you're somebody's lifeline right and so the reason that's important is it sets up pricing and we haven't with this this episode really isn't about pricing <clears throat> but when you get to a point and you're asking okay well, how do i price my product you're, if you can't possibly price your product right if you don't know what your product really is, not in your eyes, but in the eyes of the person that you're, that is buying it from you. And so, you know, for example, so when I was doing my sales training program, I hate that name, but it's the only thing that really communicates it. Cause I, it's just, I do anti-sales training. Um, you know, initially it was for people that wanted to get out of their parents' house. They, you know, you know, they have a hard time being able to get a job and succeeding enough where they can actually feel good enough to, to get an apartment on their own. And here in San Diego, that just costs a lot of money, right? And so it was like, I'm not selling sales training or how to get better at your job. I'm selling the pathway to actually have momentum on your life to a point where you can get your own car, you can have your own apartment, and you can have your own independent life and kind of not have to be at home with your parents anymore, right? You can have this confidence that, look, I can get a, I can get a great girlfriend because I have a place to bring her over to. I'm not bringing her over to mom's house, right? Um, but then when COVID hit, it was like, you know, or when we're looking at that, it's like, that doesn't really work anymore. So it's like, what am I selling now? You know, I'm, I'm not selling a product. I'm not selling a thing. They always say about a drill. You're not selling a drill and you're not even selling something that can put a hole in the wall. Those are all functional things a drill does. And you're not even selling the ability to put your TV on the wall, right? You're selling the ability to have a TV, to be able to sit and watch TV at a certain place in your house, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's kind of where you're at. And so... Let's say you let's say you go to something totally different. You look at Elon Musk or you look at people like they're selling hybrids or EV vehicles. They're not selling an electric vehicle. They're not. Yeah. They're selling ego validation. So That's it's right. like I I don't I believe I don't want to be using fossil fuels. Okay, fair enough. So you buy an electric vehicle. Well, first of all, it's completely hypocritical because when you plug your EV in, where do you think the power comes from? Like it coal. comes from coal. Yes. Right. Exactly. Or natural gas, one of the two. So you're not, you're not really, you know, you're you're substituting the chocolate donut for the jelly donut. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm not going to eat donuts. I'm not. I'm going to dump this chocolate donut. Let me give you the power do powder donut. But it's like this person gets an electric vehicle and they feel like, all right, I'm living more in synchronous to my true self and what I believe, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> the lady with the mask. Um, license plate it's the same thing it's like she's not getting a personalized plate she's not spent sending extra money to the state of california for a personalized plate she's doing something to be truer to where she believes in her own heart as crazy as she probably is that's the fact of the matter and so the reason it's important is if i'm selling a mask then it's like all right the mask costs let's say a dollar per unit to make the mask i'm going to sell it for five bucks but if you if you're selling the ability to protect yourself when no one, when there are no masks to be sold <laughs> and I'm the last, this is the only place you can go mm -hmm. that scarcity drives the price up. I mean, what's right. a person going to do? Say, I'm not going to buy from you. And then they just won't get a mask. Right. Um, the same thing. It's like, if I'm selling a Tesla, Elon Musk, his Teslas are like 60 grand, right? That's the base model. And I know he's working really hard on trying to get the price down, but it's like there's such demand for Teslas that they can set the price whatever they want to ha have them. Mm. It's one thing to say I'm, I'm creating an electric vehicle, 
the other one is saying you're buying a Tesla. You know, you're having the coolest electric car. You're part of a movement, right? And so it changes your pricing and then all of a sudden you can do it because when you understand what somebody's currency is and what drives them to make a decision and what, where their urgency is and where they kind of mentally lose their mind internally, that's where the true value of your product or your service is and your price goes up. So let's say, let's use something completely, something that I would hate doing, but let's say that you were a divorce attorney, right? It's one thing to say, well, I'm a divorce attorney. But if you say, I'm, <laughs> I have never lost a case. I'm the best divorce attorney in North County. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like the person hiring you isn't saying they're hiring a divorce attorney. They're saying, I've got a better attorney. I know for a fact that I have a better attorney than the person I'm divorcing. And I'm going to win. And so you're going to pay more money for that. You know, and even for me, like my, whenever I, I remember I, I tore my meniscus, this was like, I don't know, eight to 10 years ago. And I went and looked in my, um, in the, I looked in the, I wanted to figure out who is the best knee person, right? So I actually went to the Chargers website, you know, back when they were in town before they were a bunch of sellouts. Um, and I wanted to see who their orthopedic was. And so I looked it up and it was this guy named Dr. Frost. And I said, and I, I wonder if Dr. Frost is in my network. So I went in and sure enough, he's in the network. I'm not going to go to anybody else except for the guy who's working with the chargers. Now, if you, if you want to be fair, you could say, okay, is he the best orthopedic in the network? Well, I don't know. Are there people better than him? I don't know. Or how many people are just as good as what he does as he does? I don't know. Maybe he's the only one. Maybe there's, 50 that are, mm -hmm. that are equally as good, went to the same schools, had the same level of experience, but I didn't care. <laughs> I want to go to this guy because he's trained. There's an organization that pays these players millions and millions of dollars. And his job is to get them on the field and to protect their investment. And so that's the guy I picked. And I guarantee you, he makes more money than the orthopedic in his office. And mm -hmm. so the price goes up for that guy. And so Understanding, going back to what you said earlier, until you understand what your product really is, one, you can't price it correctly. And two, it's difficult to market because your messaging is going to be off. Right. If I'm selling a product, that's one thing. But if my people, on the other hand, view it a certain way or can view it a certain way, it's going to impact how many people buy it and at what price point. And, and the reason this was important for me when I first got into this I had kind of my intro product, I had my tripwire, my intro product, my level two product, and then I had personal coaching, which was like my high end, you know, pricing product. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so I would get in and somebody would buy my main product and go through a course and I'd set up a, you know, a free session with them. And what I'd find out is they have much bigger goals and I didn't see this coming. Like, <clears throat> you know, they wanted to start out like their own insurance agency or whatever it's like all right they're just starting out they don't really have a whole lot of plans and i realize all right their their job isn't they're really their goal isn't to just get more sales they want to get this agency launched quick and ramp up their sales massively um and there was two brothers and so what i found out was like all right well this is what they really want and that's what's really important so i was like all right well we can I can set up a coaching structure for you where we can actually kind of solve all your problems and get you from here, from here to here within a matter of months. It doesn't mean you're going to get the numbers, but you're going to know exactly what you need to do to execute on it. <clears throat> I could have said, okay, I'm going to price it on what I'm selling, which is my time. All right, we're going to sell it at X amount per hour. But then I realized that's not what they're buying. They're buying, they're buying, going from not knowing what the heck they're doing to feeling like they totally get what they need to do. And I'm the only person in their, in their, in their sphere, in their ecosystem that really can do that for them. So I'm not selling it based on my hourly rate. I'm selling it on based on what that time is worth to them in the end. And so I tripled my hourly, what I was thinking of doing. And I thought, oh, it's the first, first time I'm doing it. If I screw up, it's not a big deal. I'll have other people I can do it with. And then I set up Two, to, two or three different like lengths to the pro, to the, just to give them options because I figured all right well you know we'll charge them with murder and then we'll do involuntary manslaughter and we'll do assault you know 
<laughs> we're going to get them on one of them. And they went for the highest one. Interesting. At, mm -hmm. at the, at like, that was, that was the one where I couldn't believe I was charging that much and they went for it. And so it's like, if I had just said, yeah, I'm going to give you 10 hours of coaching, here it is. And this is how much you have to pay for it. They're going to say no. But when I'm framing it the right way and knowing what my product really is, I can charge more and I can effective, I can more effectively market the product and have mm -hmm. more success on it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I think an interesting thing about our society in particular, and I'm, I'm talking about America, United States of America, and I think this does apply to many other societies, but particularly to ours is people purchase primarily, unless it's a commodity, okay, they purchase primarily for two reasons. Number one, they wanna feel good about themselves. So they anticipate that the purchase of this product or service will help them or make them feel good about themselves. Secondly, status is everything. So in our society, it's okay to be, to, to, to look like a homeless person if you're a celebrity. Uh, it's okay to do almost anything for recognition and status. And that's why social media has become such an addiction is because it feeds into this thing that we have in our society about status and recognition and likes and et cetera. And it's a dopamine release. I mean, it, it's just what we do in our society. Um, so that's, that's something that I think uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, dovetails with what you were, you were saying in terms, of the, in terms of the audience and what they perceive they're getting and why they purchase. Secondly, I would say to the entrepreneur, you really got to decide are you going to sell five masks to 10, uh, a package of five masks to 10,000 people? Or are you going to try to get two or three customers that want to purchase 10,000 masks? Okay, as an example. As an example for you, do you want to sell a $250 program that is going to teach people about entrepreneurs and sales to 1,000 people? Or are you going to uh, charge 10,000 to five people? Um, or are you gonna go after a company and that company has a thousand employees and you're gonna provide your program to that company who is then going to make that available to their thousand employees, either as a volunteer or as a mandatory requirement. Um, I would say if you're first starting out as an entrepreneur, it's very difficult to sell a package of five masks to 10,000 people because you just don't have the, uh, the ability to, to make your product known and make what you have to offer and make it, off, and make it competitively to 10,000 people. So you're probably better off spending 80% of your time or effort looking for one customer that can buy 500 packages of five masks or uh, one customer that can spend 10 to $15,000 for your program, whether that's a company or an individual or a small business, whatever. Um, I would just say you, you, you got to look at whatever you do, you've got to look at those two different strategies very carefully and make a decision which you're gonna spend 80% of your time and energy on. Because if you make the wrong decision, um, it could cost you your business, or at the very least, it could cost you your, your paycheck, um, and you're gonna have trouble make, getting your, paying your bills at the end of the month, or keeping your employees on, or whatever it is. You look very carefully at that at the very beginning, at the very beginning in terms of your strategy and know that you may need to change your strategy down the line. Yeah, hold on, hold on one sec, just get my microphone set, I know. Got it.
All right, there we go. Um, yeah, and I think part of it we look at when you talked about like selling like one mask at a high price versus a bunch of masks to 10,000 people. It's like, you have to look at number one, like, and I suck at fishing. So it's like, you look at people that are fishing and it's like, like 10, 10 when you're fishing. Oops, hold on one second here, here, here. Come on. We need to put up that sign that says we we're go. experiencing technical difficulties. Yeah, Please no kidding. Up. It's really weird. It's really weird. It keeps switching between my Remember that in the old days? You'd be yeah. watching one of three channels on TV, and all of a sudden, there it is. And it has the tricolor little bars. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, it's like if you're going to sell to, you can try to sell a bunch of $3 masks to 10,000 people. You could sell a big you say, okay, I'm going to be a, um, a wholesaler and I'm going to try to sell 10,000 masks to this hospital, right? Right. So, and that's actually something when I first started, I was trying to figure out, okay, who do I want to sell to, right? So I'm doing sales training or anti-sales training. It's like, I can sell to individuals, which is kind of selling piecemeal to different people, or I could try to get the big fish and I could try to basically, let's say, get a Fortune 500 company. Let's say you can get somebody's call center, let's say Zappos or whatever. And it's like one of the things I quickly realized is it's like, you know, to use a baseball term, it's like, are you trying to get on base or are you trying to hit a 500 foot home run? And you can get on base a lot more easily, you know, or, you know, but if you hit a 500 foot home run, it gets you on Sports Center, but it's just like it doesn't happen all that often. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have a lot more strikeouts. So what can you afford to do? And for me, I just didn't like the per the corporate purchasing process. I knew if I had to go to a corporation, it would have to go through like eight different layers of vetting, you know, before if I won the contract, it would finally be approved. And it's like, man, this is going to take like probably eight to nine months to go through. Yes. And you're either getting all of it or you're getting nothing. Yes. Right. And I thought, well, I don't really want that to be the core of my business. Like if I do that down the line, let's say Zappos were to call me up and say, hey, we want you to do some training for our people. All right. I can be an add on, but they need to come to me first. I really don't want to have, you know, be me going deep water fishing. Like I'm going to be looking for the Megalodon. Right. That's not my business plan. So I think in the beginning, you just have to get some successes. You just have to get, you know, pick the low hanging fruit, build some success, feel you know, and after over time, you figure out what works, what people like. I mean, you actually have to quiz them. You don't just take the order and try to figure it out, but actually have that follow up process. What do you like? What do you not like? What did what made you buy it? What were your concerns? What would you change? Like at the end of my products, at the end, of, every time somebody goes to the end of the course, that's that's one of the, I don't know, it's not even the end of the course now. They think of it. it's probably week four or five. Is you know, I'm saying, hey, what do you like about the course? What would you like added? What would you like changed? And it gives me some ideas on things that maybe I didn't think of before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, like what's one thing, you know, have you referred anybody? Is there anything that you would want to see more of um, in, in order to feel like, you know, you'd be more eagerly referring this program to somebody else. But you, end, you have to end up doing that research. But in the end, it's like, you got to make money, period. You got to yes. make money. You have to have successes. And you don't say, I'm going to, I've never played baseball on an organized level. I'm going to go try out for the Yankees. <laughs> like if I don't get the Yankees, I'm just not playing. Like, are you kidding me? No, you gotta like well, do something. Could, they still need greeters at Walmart, you know. So right, but build up your resume. You know, like <laughs> it's like graduating from law school and then and saying, okay, unless I work in the White House legal on the you know for the White House law group or whatever they're called, the mm. White House lawyers, I'm not gonna have to take any job unless unless it's Harvard. Like, I'm, I'm not going to be, unless I, the only job I'm going to take is I'm going to be faculty at Harvard. Like, uh, no, you probably want to get a job. Let's get a job first, mm -hmm. you know, and then you can decide what you want to do. But I think, again, it goes back to understanding your client, mm -hmm. understanding pricing, marketing, and, and even kind of the, um, the way you want to market and who you want to market to, mm -hmm. you know, and understanding who they are. So like, if you understand, let's say that you used to be, um, in corporate purchasing, you know, then you kind of have a better idea, or maybe you have a ton of contacts and in in, high level contacts in an industry, then yeah, go for it by all means. But I don't think that's the place to start. I think you want to start with the easy stuff.
get some successes right. under your belt. Right. Um, yeah, one you, of the things. You, yeah. No, oh, no, go for it. Oh, I was just going to say that. Yeah, you're going. You're going up a curve. And one thing that the entrepreneur needs to be uh, totally aware of and anticipate the possibility that they may get a huge order. And if they do get that huge order, they don't want to end up losing a little on each sale and making it up in volume. Um, I have seen situations in my life uh, in the business world, in the world of entrepreneur and small business where they got a huge contract. Somehow they landed a whale, but they couldn't get the whale on board the boat. You know, they weren't equipped for it. So what they ended up doing is working 10, 12 hours a day, sometimes more, getting this product to the customer and it just it, and ended up losing money. They ended up losing money because they weren't equipped to handle a huge order. I've seen it in the in the computer arena. Um, I knew a I knew a guy that had a small uh, computer retail type operation, and he landed a huge order where he had to make all these computers and have them delivered. And the quality went down. Uh, working 10, 12 hours a day. And uh, essentially he underbid his competitors in order to get this project. So he, at, at a point in time, he was literally making and shipping computers at a loss in order to get to, to fulfill this contract. So you need to be very careful that if you do land a whale, that you're prepared to, 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 to provide that at a profit Okay, and I don't mean one dollar, you know, on a hundred dollar item is your profit because that's not a real profit. Most entrepreneurs do not take into consideration what their real costs are. Just like companies that have uh, that are always uh, 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 skimping on the maintenance of their equipment, for example. Uh, so they never maintain their equipment. They end up paying a huge amount in the future for equipment that breaks down and then they have to buy new equipment or there, there are costs associated with delivering your service or product that aren't obvious. You need to factor those in. So that's very important. And uh, I remember back in the computer days when I was doing the computer services, I promised myself that um, I, as far as customers, I never wanted to sell computers to lawyers, doctors, or the government. And I won't go into the details of why, but let's just say they were not my ideal customer. And um, they, they, either they wanted it for too little and they demanded too much of me um, and my company or they were just impossible to deal with. So really, really, really look very carefully at who you want your customer or client to be. What exactly are you gonna to provide to them? And what's the least amount of profit that you need to keep, make your business sustainable? And uh, if you don't, if you just get excited because you got the deal, you're like, there are, there's, there's all kinds of entrepreneurs that do this. There are contractors out there, for example, that want to keep their people busy. So they take on a project knowing that they're not going to make any money on it, but they're going to keep their people employed. Okay. I understand that sometimes that's a necessity in business, but again, you don't, you're, you don't want your motto to be we lose a little on each sale and we make it up in volume. And that's just something I want the entrepreneurs out there to really pay attention to. Yes, you're gonna get some money in the door. Make sure you get it in now, as opposed to 90 days from now. That's one reason I never wanted to work for the government because it always took them 90 to 120 days to pay for anything. They always wanted it at the lowest price. 
and you're dealing with so many levels of bureaucracy that by the time you're done with the deal, you literally want to shoot yourself in the head. Now, there were other entities out there that thrived off of working with the government and sold ungodly amounts of computers and services to the government, but they were prepared and set up to do so. They knew what they were getting into. They knew how to do the contracts properly. They knew how to deal with the multiple levels of bureaucratic uh, shenanigans. They knew how to come out of it on the other end with a profit. And it just wasn't my thing. And make sure that if you do find yourself in the swamp hitting alligators over the head, so to speak, make sure that you can recover from that. Um, and don't just take a deal or make a sale because you need to pay the light bill this month. It's, it's very tempting, but it could be could be the, the end of your business if you don't do it properly. So that is my suggestion, recommendation to you entrepreneurs out there. Yeah, and, and, and just to cap on that, I think that's a great point. I think it's one thing to get to sign a new customer. It's the other thing you have to ask, is it the right customer for you to retain? Because it's like, okay, I can date a supermodel, but there's a lot of headaches that come with dating a supermodel. Like, you know, can you handle it? Like, that's a heavy lift. So, you know, it's like, I always said, like, you know, if I had my short list, Selma Hayek would be on there, but it's like, uh, Latinas can be crazy sometimes. <laughs> so you Especially better be able to- carry knives. So you gotta watch out better... if they're carrying a knife. That is true. Or a gun. You better be like, you better, you, it's, you better be able to ride that, you know, you'll be, be able to stay on that bull, so to speak, because it's not Ooh. easy. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny because they had, a, um, who was it? Matchbox 20. They had a song. Um, what is it? I think it's, there was one of the songs they had. The guy is married to this Colombian girl, like unbelievably hot girl. And he wrote a song. Yeah. It was If You're Gone, I think is the name of the song. It was like this whole song. The whole song was about the fact that, he can't, he married above his pay grade and he can't handle her. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. like, he's worried, like she's going to leave him. Cause like, even this guy who's the head of a rock band is like, yeah, I can't even handle this woman. Like I can't handle her. Like, geez. Yeah. Yeah. And remember that if you are trying to date a supermodel or you're dating a supermodel or you're, you're, you're landing a huge deal be very careful that you're not doing it for status or because you think you'll feel better about yourself. That's not what you're in business for. You're not in business to be a status symbol, okay? No matter how good it feels to have bragging rights to your buddies or your competitors. And you're not doing it necessarily to feel good about yourself. You're doing it to provide a service or product at a profit that has value for your customer, even if your customer doesn't really know what they want, uh, it's just, and that's another question altogether we should address at some point. But just keep in mind, you do not fall into the trap. And I can't stress this enough. You do not fall into the trap of closing a deal, marrying a supermodel, Delivering a product or client, uh, delivering a product or service because it gives you status or if you feel good about yourself. That is the kiss of death. Yeah, and it's not about you. I mean, like, you're, it's, it's just you kind of got to get it through your head. It's really not about you. And if you're, if you're focusing on yourself and not the person that you're trying to solve their problem for you're going to quickly find they're going to figure out really quick that you're not thinking about them and they're going to pick up and they're going to leave <clears throat> you know this isn't a therapy session you're not sell, you're not saying oh i want to sell this product so i can feel better about myself no 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 absolutely not that's it's backwards mm -hmm. so let's hit on the next one so um and this one is just near and dear to my heart and i'm curious on what you would uh on what you would say to this because we haven't really talked about this but um, when I, I would say there's a term I have called, it's a force full of hunters. When you go to networking events and everybody's out there trying to sell to each other, but no one's looking to buy. It's like going out in the middle of a forest 
and everybody in there, there's no deer, there's no game, and everybody's shooting at each other, right? They didn't come there to buy, and they're all coming there to sell. And so I would say one of the biggest mistakes people do early on is they want to, first of all, they want to feel busy. So they go to networking events, and they want to mm-hmm. like meet people and get better. But they spend all their time selling at networking events. And there's certain, and I'm not, I'm not here to denigrate any of them, but just the nature of like, there's ones where you do like speed networking. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I'm going to hand all my, as many business cards as I can out. Like I call it, I call it, um, you know, being a, a business card dealer, right? I'm going to spend all my time dealing out business cards and I'm going to feel like my success is based on the number of people that I talked to and the number of business cards that I gave out. But it's like you're spending hours of your day that you could be either doing any number of things, but you're basically trying to sell your wares at a networking event when no one is there to buy them. This isn't a trade show. It's like if you're selling rifles, then go to a gun show because everybody that comes in is looking to buy a gun. But it's like you don't go sell, you don't go, they're trying to sell gun shows at a gun manufacturing conference. Like that's not, that's not what you should be doing. And so I just think it's, it's, it sets you up for a lot of failure because you're trying to figure out what works and, and how to sell people. And yet no one is going to buy from you. None. So you're going to get a 0% success rate and you're not even learning about your target market because odds are everybody you're talking to there is not in your target market. So you're spending this time, you're getting failure after failure. And on top of that, you're not learning what you need to learn about your prospects. Mm-hmm. So you might gain some things. I mean, there's nothing wrong with networking events for sure. I mean, you could be a better speaker. You could learn more contacts. You could bounce ideas off people by all means. There's a lot of good that can come from networking events. Um, But expecting sales and spending your time trying to sell people at them, like you'll stand up and give your elevator pitch as if somebody in the room is going to go, oh my gosh, Matt's finally here. I've been looking for you for years. I want to buy as much as I can off you. That's never going to happen. And I, th- I think the expectations are just way off base. And, it, and it, it, you know, having that intention when you go to these networking events, um, I think is deleterious or destructive to kind of your growth curve as you're going up. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, that's interesting. Uh, the networking thing. I've been to many networking events and I have actually created my own networking events, which I promoted primarily through Meetup and uh as as a platform and i've had a fairly uh, reasonable amount of success um i would say that um the networking events that i have attended even though i provide marketing strategy and uh consulting and coaching i felt like everybody in the room could be a potential client however upon further inspection uh, I realized that 90% of the people in the room were not potential clients for a variety of reasons. Either they weren't really in business for themselves, they were actually, you know, uh, part of a multi-level marketing thing, or they were they were financial consultants that were working for some big corporation, or they were insurance salespeople, etc. But and that was okay. Um, the other of the 20% that were left in the room, uh, at least half of those people could not afford my services. They just didn't have the money to do it. There's, they're just you know, doing the best they can to get started or they doing this part-time or they had a regular full-time job and this was their side gig or whatever. Um, so half of the, the, the remaining 20% could not afford my services, but that still left 10% that could. Um, So the main reason, the main thing I got out of the networking was you're not networking to the people that are in the room. You're networking to the people they know. That's number one. So if you meet somebody and they are selling insurance or they are selling Mary Kay, or they are just started as a coach or whatever, keep in mind, you're not selling to that person. You are establishing yourself. You're, 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 you're presenting yourself and establishing yourself as someone who has a solution 
or somebody that they might know. So that's number one. Number two, it's a good learning experience. You have a chance when you're networking and cultivating relationships with people in the room. If somebody is in insurance, you can ask them questions about insurance. If they're a real estate agent, you can ask them questions about real estate. Maybe they won't have the answer, but maybe they'll know somebody that does have the answer. So it's a good learning experience and it's practice at presenting yourself. Uh, it gives you a much better idea of who your target market is. And um, I would recommend that if you go to a networking uh, type situation, it shouldn't be something that you're paying to go to. I don't, number one, I don't get up at 7 a.m. to go eat a, a, a bad breakfast at some Denny's or someplace and pay 10 or $15 for the privilege of going there and listening to other people give me their sales pitch. I just don't do it. You might want to do it. Fine. If you want to do it, give it, a, give it a shot and realize that it's going to take a significant amount of time for you to establish yourself and maybe get some referrals from the people who know, who, from the people in the room, possibly, or if they really like you, and you have a chance to have a conversation with them, then maybe they will, over a period of time, recommend somebody to you that they know. And, and that's, that's it, really, that's it. I find that most of the people that are networking um, enjoy, just enjoy meeting other people and their social animals and uh, they see it as just another way of getting the word out about what they do and who they are and their personalities and so forth. And that's the way I looked at it. And what I found, if you're good, if you're going to network, um, you know, be prepared, be prepared that uh everybody is going to give you a sales pitch and the people that don't give you a sales pitch a lot of times they don't they don't have any need for your services either because they don't even know what it is that they do okay so that that, that that's what i have to say about networking all right yeah and i i think a lot of people just think it's like it's, you know i don't want to sit at home and do nothing i can at least go around and be around people but you know, you have to, you're a custodian for your enterprise and you need to figure out what's best for your business. So mm -hmm. I'm with you. I'm not get, I'm not going to Denny's for breakfast at eight o'clock so I can sit around and be the 21st person to give my elevator pitch. Like that's not going to happen. I just don't have the patience for it. And I can see that you don't either. So. Nope. Um, all right. So next one we want to hit on is, and we'll, we're going to wrap up pretty soon. Um, I, I say, I'm going to say this jokingly, but we're going to get to the bigger picture, but I say the biggest, one of the biggest mistakes is buying ads on Twitter or Bing. Um, and, and I say that only because it's like, well, first of all, they're money holes, but the bigger picture is spending money on advertising without specific goals in mind. So people sit here say, okay, I'm starting a business. I'm going to spend $500 per month or $300 per month on advertising when realistically, I used to work in this industry and I used to be a media planner. So my whole job was like assigning where to spend money and assigning its effectiveness and, uh, you know, kind of how to get the maximum return on investment. So typically they always say, you know, people ask, how much money should I spend on advertising? And they say, well, it's a twofold answer. If you're not getting, if you're not getting that money back in return, the answer is zero. <laughs> And on the maximum end, what's how much should I spend on advertising? It's like, well, if you're positive ROI, so if you spend 100 and get 150 back, then you spend as much money as you can. I mean, if I can spend 500 and get 750 back, that's great. But if I can spend 2,000 and get 3,000 back, that's even better. Mm -hmm. So, but the idea is when you start out, you're not going to be positive ROI. You're really not. So initially when you spend money, you want to be very sparingly in, in the military, they call it fire discipline. You don't want to shoot all your rounds. You need to be very cognizant of every round that you shoot that's effectively aimed and shot with a purpose. And so mm -hmm. um, initially it's like, okay, I'm going to spend X amount, but I have a very short term goal. So my goal is I want to make sure I think this is who my target market is. I think this is who's going to respond to my advertising. So you set up targeting in Facebook or Google or wherever you're doing. 
and you spend a hundred bucks or whatever it is, and you come back usually a couple days later, and then you take a look and see kind of who is responding to that ad. So you think, is it mm-hmm. going to be mostly men? Well, then you find out that 60% of females are the ones clicking on your ads. Okay. Well, now that I know that, it's like you might want to retool your marketing, but you don't want to have your ma- your advertising running while you're retooling your marketing. But you want to have a certain goal. You may say, okay, I want to figure out, is my, are my ads better or more effective on Facebook or Google? And you run them both. And then you run a little, I, I have a spreadsheet where I run, I look at them and I find that, hey, for what I'm doing here, Google's like 10 times more efficient than Facebook. Well, I'm probably not going to spend much, if anything, on Facebook. Maybe I might try to tweak the Facebook ones and see if I can get a winner there. But if I'm getting a 10 to 1 you know, return on investment or click-through rate, then I'm going to spend money on Google. So, and then from there, it's like, all right, should I spend money on like text ads or should I put money on YouTube? And then you do a split and you want to figure out as quick as you can. You want to fail and fail quick. You want to establish as quick as you can where you're spending that money so that in the, in let's say a month or two, you've already learned about six or seven or eight different lessons on what people are better responding to. And you want to spend as little money as possible um, in the process. Mm -hmm. And then when you actually start to get positive ROI, that's when you kind of want to increase your budget. But that's not even eternal. Like you're not going to get positive ROI and say, I'm just going to stick this on autopilot because eventually you're going to get that that law of diminishing returns is going to set in. And so the advertising becomes stale or you've spent, you've hit all of your best targets and there's not enough new targets with enough solid interest to, to keep that going. So mm-hmm. the biggest thing that I see is people are going to spend money on Facebook or Google because they figure they need to get the, the word out. And it's almost like paying your friendly mobster to keep your, to keep your restaurant safe when you don't necessarily have to do that. And at the same time, you also want to make sure you're exploring, and you hit on this a little bit earlier, your free traffic models. So it could be word of mouth. It could be a YouTube channel. It could be a podcast. Um, it could be going on somebody else's podcast. Um, where you're not spending money to get the word out. So I think number one is just unnecessarily, I made this mistake big time in the beginning, was spending money and thinking that, man, it's like, I, if I throw money on advertising, people will definitely buy my product. And that's not true. Mm-hmm. It's like going out fishing and, and, and getting the big boat and getting this Costco sized box or crate of bait. But you don't know how to fish and you don't know where to fish. And you don't know what fish are there, and do the fish respond to this bait or not? But it's only when you know I'm gonna sh- I'm a, I'm, a, I'm only fishing for this type of fish. I know where they live, and this is the bait that they always respond to. That's when you should go out. If you want to get your Costco sized bait, by all means. But you better, like you said earlier, have a boat that you can bring all that fish back in. Otherwise, you're wasting your time. So mm-hmm. you want to fail quickly, but you want to fail as inexpensively as possible, and learn the quickest, cheapest lessons you can learn. All right, so uh, we're at a little hard break on here. So uh, through the magic of technology, I had, well, we had my Zoom basically froze on me. So we uh, basically had a hard break. We're just editing right back coming into it. So if you are doing something and you have your Zoom break or something else break in the middle of a webinar or uh, a call, just understand it happens to the best of us. So um, last couple items that we just want to hit on real quick, and we're going to close out our show today. Uh, number one, failing to get feedback on business, or actually, we'll just do a hard break again because we already hit this one. Um, okay, five, four, three, two, one. All right, so we had a little hard break right here. Um, for those who wonder if if you know crazy stuff happens to them, we just had my Zoom totally freeze on me. Um, so if you're wondering why we're just breaking into this last segment, it's because I had to do a, a cold shut off of Zoom and uh, get back in here. So uh, we'll just wrap up on the last topic today. Um, Last big mistake that most new entrepreneurs make, and I remember seeing this early on in mine, um, is people quit believing in your idea too soon. So you have an idea, let's say that you're four or five months in and you're struggling, you're not able to really effectively know what the people are buying as opposed to what you're selling. And I'll put video back on. There we go. Um, and so what happens is you're, you're not 
effectively building from the mistakes that you make and learning and getting closer. So when you play golf, you hit your driver, it hits the farthest, but it's the least active. And then every club gets more narrowly accurate toward the hole until you get the putter, right? Mm. And so the idea in business, you want to be making mistakes for the sense of learning about, um, learning about, you know, kind of what you can do better. And so what happens is you make the mistakes and maybe you're not having the right idea or you're not executing it well enough. And so you give up too soon. And I remember I was sitting in a cafe after a meetup group and this guy was telling, you know, I was sitting there working and the guy says, yeah, if I don't get anything in the next three months, I'm just going to quit. And I remember that just, it hit me and I'm like, wow, like you might as well quit then because you need to be the biggest advocate for your business. And if you already have an exit plan, then it, it tells me that you're, you know, you're really not focusing the way you need to on getting this done. Now, that being said, if you've been in the same business for six years and nobody's bought your product, well, then maybe, yeah, you're in the wrong line at that point. And you know, maybe you're the problem, you know, the business idea isn't viable enough or maybe you're not ready. You know, maybe you just, you know, haven't, you're not making the mistakes in the right way where you're building forward. But realistically, it gets to a point where you don't know how close you are from an inflection point. And a lot of people, business owners think that they're going to build their business. It's a linear curve, or maybe even it's a little bit parabolic where it goes up. But in my experience, I want to get your take on this, Al, is it's not so predictable of a curve or a line, but it's more boom, boom, boom. And then you have an inflection point where things take off. You know, for me, I, I was struggling and trying to initially trying to figure out who my market was. And then one month I hit and I got, you know, a bunch of sales, three big coaching clients that came in and my revenue went from very, very small to the first profit I ever had. It was my third month in my business. Um, and it was crazy. I can't tell you what magically I did differently, but there was something in the mistake where I fixed it and tailor the message where all of a sudden people were starting to respond better to it. And so I'd say, number one, you really have to make sure that, you know, you're kind of not wanting to quit too soon on your idea because part of it's based on this, like, your goal's wrong. Like, I need to make X amount of sales by X amount of time or I'm quitting. Or if I don't make this in this amount of time, um, then you're quitting. And you can't really be so quick to pull the parachute, right? Just because an enemy fighter is following you in your plane doesn't mean you pull the parachute, right? I mean, you, there's a lot of lessons to be learned and you could have a valuable business idea. And it could be like we talked about last week where there's my friend Simon, the British guy, Simon Hewitt. You know, he's patrolling. Look, at, he, he, had, he found a business that, that could be making tons of money. It was mismanaged. He bought the business and, and turned it around and, and it became a very profitable business. So you don't want to give up on your idea too soon. And if it's something where over time you just are, you know, you're making mistakes, but you're not learning from them and nobody buys from you, then it's fair enough to reassess it. But you don't necessarily want to quit too soon because you have a goal that isn't really aligned. It's a goal based on your ego or it's a randomly assigned goal that you came up with. Like, I'm going to make 50 grand this year. And if I don't make 50 grand this year, then I'm just going to quit at the end of the year. Well, that's, that's stupid. 50 grand is a random number. But if you're starting to notice that you're filing for bankruptcy, you're going into debt or something bad is happening because of, you know, kind of where your business is at, then yeah, you might want to reassess it. But quitting, having the tendency to quit too soon because you have, of a goal that you assigned that isn't tied to anything material I think is a big mistake. And a lot of business owners feel like, and a lot of business owners feel like they need to, uh, you know, they need to be successful in a certain amount of time because that's their goal or they want to please their dad or they don't want to be a disappointment to their family or something that really has nothing to do with why you started your business. If I'm a CPA, I just passed the exam and I want to, you know, start my own company then it's like, I'm not trying to make X amount of dollars to prove to my dad that I have a really tough relationship with that I can finally do it or to prove to my wife that it was a smart decision to quit my job, right? But you want to give it every chance in the world. You want to give every chance. You want to try. You want to succeed. You want to learn from every mistake. You want to go to networking events to learn from people who are in your industry to help, you know, run your business better, to, to, to really... Um, 
new, you know, what's the word I want to use in English, but nuance, make sure your message is better tailored, is nuanced, is more effective um, and do everything you can. And, and maybe you're in the right business at the wrong time. Maybe you're the wrong person for the business, or maybe you're like that book that we talked about. You're three feet from gold. You're this close to an inflection point, but just, you know, continuing to push forward and be the, the biggest evangelist and believer of your business. Um, I think it's very, very important, you know, right. and maybe your business starts out as one thing and it evolves into something else, right? You look at the, 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 the sticky note, they were trying to test out glue for book binding and it figured, and it was, and it was weak. So they passed out the crappy product samples to the secretaries at 3M and they loved it. And all of a sudden they created sticky notes. My father-in-law is a toxicology guy and he was involved at Viagra and he said they were trying to test a heart drug and they said it was really weird. Every time we gave it to these mice, they got little mini hard-ons <laughs> and he goes, oh, and so they went from trying to develop a heart drug, which wasn't working to, to, to randomly stumbling upon something that's totally different. So you just never know where things are going to happen. You don't know where they're going to go. You don't know how quickly you're going to turn around and you don't know where the inflection point is. Right. And it's okay to quit down the line if, if it makes the most sense down the line, but you don't want to quit too early because you have a goal that's set that isn't aligned with a, with a legitimate objective business goal. Right. Right. Those are very good points, Matt. And um, the only thing I would add to that is the two main the two main um, criteria that I would recommend that entrepreneurs uh, look at very carefully, in addition to what you said, which is obviously they have to have a passion for their for what they do. They have to be good at it, and they have to they have to be the the, the best advocate and 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 champion. Uh, cheerleader, whatever you want to call it for their business, obviously, um, is, is it sustainable and is it scalable? First, is it sustainable? Um, and then is it scalable? And I would say that the, the most, one of the most important things I would add to what you said, Matt, in conclusion, because we're coming up on, on almost two and a half hours here, but in conclusion, as they say, um, I would say, look at your infrastructure. Do you have enough phone lines? Do you have enough bandwidth? Do you have enough uh, 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 space to store whatever these items are? Make sure that you have the infrastructure in place so that when the sales do come in and when the business does start to accelerate, you can handle it. Because if you cannot handle it, then you'll be, it'll be death by success. And that's the worst way to go, really, is to, to know that you've got these sales coming in, but you can't handle it, you know? Um, and what most entrepreneurs do is they say, well, I'll just work more hours. So now they're working 20 hours a day um, when they should only be working about eight hours a day because they don't have the infrastructure to handle it. And they're not, they are sustainable, but they're not scalable. That's all I have to say for today in conclusion to, um, to what you said, Matt. Yeah, definitely. And I think as, as long as you're in the business of solving problems and answering those questions and getting better at what you do, the Kaizen philosophy, a little bit better every day, um, then in the long term, you're going to be successful. And maybe it's mm -hmm. the intent of what your first product is. Maybe it's a different product in the same industry. Maybe it's a, something that you, you get you realize you have a skill set, and all of a sudden it evolves into something else for the same industry. You just don't know what it is. Right. But I think going back to your thing that you had mentioned earlier before, if you're trying to, if you're trying to basically assuage yourself and make yourself feel better about, you know, feeling better about yourself, but you know, having your business idea do that for you, you're going to, you're, you're going to fail because you're trying to serve two masters. You're trying to serve the master of the person you're trying to sell to and you're trying to make yourself feel better. This is not a therapy session. Right. This is a job of just trying to get in better little by little. What, what can I do better? What, can, what are the things that aren't working that I need to stop doing? Um, you know, and, and kind of figure that out. 
you know, and I think if you're focused on your customer the whole time and, 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 and solving their problem and being better for them, right. Mm -hmm. Then I think more, more likely than not, you're going to be successful in the end. And maybe that right. involves increasing your skill set in a certain area. Um, you know, who knows what it means, but, you know, you need to be lock solid, dead set focused on that and not trying to say, to have this be some mechanism for ego validation on your part. Like I've never done anything good and I'm finally going to do something right and make myself feel like I'm worth it. You know, it's like, no, it's a, it's a rough and tumble jungle out there and you got to be ready to fight and to battle and to be ready at all times because you never know. You could have a great business and all of a sudden something crazy happens that threatens it. You could have a partner that you find out is embezzling all your money, um, any number of things. But you need to have your eye on the ball the entire time. Right. And all I would like to add in conclusion to my conclusion, uh, Matt, is if you're listening to this and you're having trouble figuring that stuff out, do not hesitate to contact us because we either can help you as an individual or we can at least listen to what you have to say and include something about it in our next podcast. So reach out to us, contact us, and I'm sure we can help. And uh, that's all I can say for today. All right. We appreciate you guys being through us today, especially through our little technical difficulties. Um, if you have any questions, you want to reach out to Al individual, his contact information is in the show notes. Uh, and if you want to reach out to me as well, to Matt, uh, then you can reach out to me in the show notes as well. Uh, with that being said, uh, we will see you guys next week. My name is Matt. And I am Al. And uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks so much.